Um, right here, yeah. Yes, it'll be on the recording. <laughs> so we're just doing a quick land acknowledgement. Um, this conference is presented on land that has been stewarded by indigenous people since before European colonization. We, as we work to heal the destruction caused by colonization, we appreciate your support, solidarity, and continued learning. Um, we have a whole host of organizations that we work with. And if people are logging in from all over, I bet you have some folks that you work with as well. Um, but here's a short list. So we've just had our lunch and some caucus groups here, skipping by that. Really quick thank you to our sponsors, Tony Field Organic, all of these fine folks um, for their conference. Thank you, thank you. A quick plug here to join the NOFA Massachusetts team. They are hiring. And it's time for our presentation. Um, so we're joined today by Richard Robinson. And if you give me a second, I will queue up his slides. Um, and Richard, yeah, if you do want to come in front of the yeah. camera now. Yeah. All right. Let's see if I can project it. Hello, welcome. Um, where, where, where? where? Should be uh, this ah. little button right there. Turns it into full screen. Hmm. What was that? Yeah, it shouldn't be any of those things. It should be there if you hit that. You hit that, it should be. Oh, right. First. Fantastic. From Hope Still Farm and on the board. Right. Oh, and yeah, now, if we can just flip that yeah. my way so I can operate the controls. And I can do it. No, that's fine. This is actually easy. Yeah. Great. Um, hi, folks. Thanks. Uh, Richard Robinson. I uh, farm, certified organic farm in Sherborne, Massachusetts. I'll tell you a little bit more about it in a minute. Uh, for folks at home, I'm going to be standing here, but you don't really need to see me. The question is whether you can hear me. And um, if you can't, you probably want to let Zia know pretty quick. Um, but um, we're just going to go right ahead. The, uh, I don't know what that blue thing is, but we'll just ignore it. I hope it's not going to be in the way of too much. Okay. Um, I'll give you the, sh the real short version here, just in case we have a fire alarm while, uh, while we're going here. Um, the way to grow great garlic, uh, lay down as much compost as you can afford. Three inches is a lot. Uh, but It'll repay you in space. Um, push the clothes oh, some nitrogen fertilizer. We'll talk more about uh, each of these things. Push the clothes in about a half an inch. Don't bury it. Just put it at the top of that. And then cover it with leaves. And I do mean four to six inches. In fact, if you go eight, um, you won't have any problems either. Uh, irrigate it. Uh, wouldn't need that this spring. But um, if you irrigate it. And then, oops, I got to be on my X here. Uh, and then um, harvest in the And we'll talk about each of these things. But the, the key, I think, to, to growing great garlic, no surprise, is great soil. And I think you can um, uh, get from mediocre soil to good garlic soil really quickly uh, with an application of compost. It's not hard, as far as I can tell. Um, so uh, where I farm, Hope Still Farm, is in Sherborne, about 20 miles west of Boston. Uh, we're certified organic. We, uh, do Christmas tree, cultural Christmas trees as well as vegetables. Um, you can barely see it here on the picture, but we grow in hoop houses here and then out in uh, outdoor out, out gardens. Um, I've been uh, growing garlic for over 10 years, I guess, maybe 12 at this point. Hi there, how are you? Um, and um, and continue to scale up. Uh, it's still I'm still a very small time garlic grower, we're up to about 2,600 heads. Um, and uh, that's uh, better than double from just a couple of years ago. Uh, we'll talk about how to scale up if you want to scale up. And I encourage you to because continuing to buy somebody else's seed garlic um, rather than using your own as uh, in order to get bigger 
Um, you'll save money if you, uh, if you do it yourself. Uh, a really important uh, distinction in the garlic world. Uh, oh, I should stop asking. Um, does anybody here not yet grow garlic? OK, good. So you probably know this distinction between hard neck and soft neck. Um, soft necks, uh, when they come up, their leaves are not uh, superseded by a giant stiff stalk. And so, it's, so when it's finished growing, those soft leaves are available for braiding, which is primarily what soft neck garlic is used for. And you can make absolutely gorgeous braids. I can't tell you how to grow soft neck garlic, except that it's essentially exactly like growing hard neck garlic. I grew some a while ago when I started. I had a bad year with it. Um, and I said, I don't need to do this anymore. So I just focused on hard neck. Um, but if you want to uh, make garlic braids, uh, which is really where the only money is in, in soft neck garlic, um, that's the garlic to grow. And these um, by uh, Sadie Frost, who uh, farms at Clove of Happiness. Clever name, yeah. Sadie Frost and Happiness. Um, you will, if you're not braiding it, I don't think you will find much of a market for it. Chefs don't want it. Most people who are familiar with um, hard neck garlic, the clove's much bigger than hard neck garlic. Uh, and so it's really kind of hard to cook. Anyway, hard neck is not for braiding. Um, you get fewer and large cloves. It's called hard neck. I will talk more about this as we go on uh, because it sends up this stalk uh, and then um, eventually it sends up the flower. I'll talk more about this. This is not what you want to grow. Do not try, do not hope that you grow something that looks like this. Um, it has a tiny head down here. It has put so much of its energy into this giant stalk that it's just, I love it because it's as big as me, but I'm, I'm not happy that it grew. This was a volunteer. I, you know, when you harvest your garlic, inevitably you miss a couple. And this is one of those volunteers. Um, and I've never seen one this tall, mostly the this tall. But anyway, that's what this is. We'll talk a little bit more about it probably as we go on. So um, multiple, whoops, I got back to uh, multiple strains. Of garlic, that you will see these names. I really cannot tell you very much about them at all. I grow only German Extra Hardy, which is, as far as I, I think, generally proclaimed to be the most bulletproof garlic there is to grow. Um, it's just, it's really hard to have a problem with it. Um, and so, and I don't know whether it's a rocambole or a porcelain or something else, but somebody knows somewhere. If anybody knows here, please tell me. Um, but in any event, there are there are multiple strains. Uh, Carl Hammer, who uh, runs Vermont Compost, uh, gave a workshop on growing garlic at the summer conference a few years back, and he said, "I've been growing garlic for a long time, and I, I, for a while I used to grow different varieties and keep it separated. But over time, they just all kind of became the same thing. Uh, so I'm I'm not sure. Real garlic aficionados might be able to tell you." I can't tell you why you would want to grow local or porcelain or, or music or something like that. Um, music, I think, is a specific variety, not a, a group of them. So uh, real quick, again, if you grow garlic, you probably know this, but just to just to get us all on the same, the same page, um, you uh, plant individual cloves. So the garlic you know, grow, grows as a head. You break that apart. You plant individual cloves. Um, early in November is kind of where I think climate change is bringing us. The advice used to be in, in southern New England to be uh, late October or even late October, but I think we're past that. Um, the idea is to plant it early enough so that it sends out a lot of really strong roots, but late enough so you don't get uh, top growth emerging uh, above your mulch. Um, it's, it's not a disaster if you see a little bit of uh, green coming up, but it's better if you do. The sprouts will emerge in early spring. This year, because we hardly had a winter, those sprouts emerged in February. Uh, it, as every garlic grower I know, it was, it was crazy, but it worked out. They ended up uh, doing really well, but came up really early. 
And then uh, in late spring, uh, the hardnecks will grow that stalk up. Uh, we'll put a little curlicue on the top of it. We'll talk about scapes in a minute. And then uh, relatively quickly, late June, early July, the, the plant will begin to go uh, dormant. It will begin to lose its uh, greenery. Uh, these will dry down. These are the old leaves. Lose its greenery and go into uh, dormancy mode. And your goal is to get it out of the ground just as late as you can before the head splits open. And the head will split open. If you leave it in the ground too long, the head will split open. It's fine if it does. In fact, if you're growing it for your own or you're growing it for uh, growing back up into uh, more seed garlic, it'll, it'll uh, keep perfectly well. Uh, after the head splits open, but it's hard to market. Most people won't want to buy a head of garlic that, that the clothes are showing rather than still wrapping up, uh, rather than still being wrapped up uh, inside. So the goal is to get it out of the ground before that happens to, to interrupt its uh, its full dormancy. Hi, how are you? Um, so I want to talk about how I uh, plant garlic. There are lots of different ways to do it. I'm just going to talk about how I do it. I've been pretty successful with it. Um, the most, you know, the most important first step is to make sure that your soil is rich and the minerals are well balanced. I really recommend a soil test. I really recommend you follow the soil test recommendations for your major nutrients and, and the minors as well. Um, if you've had a soil test in the last year or so, I don't think there's any real, and you're looking to sort of expand, but within that same garden, I don't think there's probably any reason to go for another soil test right in front of, of, your, uh, of your planting. But if you haven't had your soil tested in a couple of years, it's probably a real good, real good idea to do it. Um, and then I, you know, I think uh, two or three inches of compost is, as I say, it's a lot. It, that's a lot of compost. If you think of a hundred foot long, 30 inch wide bed, an inch of compost is just about exactly a yard of compost. And so I'm recommending two yards of compost down that 100 foot bed and prices have gone up. Um, and so even I have you know, swallow a little hard uh, before I do that. But as I say, it will repay you, especially if you are, you know, if you want to make money on your garlic, um, it's, a, it's a really good investment. You pay 60, 70 bucks or something for that yard. Uh, let's say you put in $100 worth of, of compost, maybe $150 worth of compost. Um, you'll get that back, what, tenfold or something like that, uh, on that on the garlic that you plant. Uh, oh, but you've got other investments as well. You've got the garlic itself, and your labor, and so forth. But it's a good investment. Garlic is certainly one of the most valuable crops you can grow. Bar none, hands down. Tomatoes, yes. Lettuce, yes. Uh, probably in, in that order, roughly speaking. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how they come out, but if you're looking to make some money, that's that's it. So, um, a couple of things. Um, I grow uh, almost entirely no-till, and I really recommend it. Not specifically for garlic. It's just because, for all the reasons that you know, we're probably on a bird about. It's a real good idea, good for soil, good for your, your plants. Um, in any event, whether or not you till, after you till, if you put the compost on top and then don't mix it in, um, there's no reason to. Your, your garlic will be very, very happy just growing right in that compost that you're gonna, that you're gonna put in there. Um, and then I like to spread a little organic nitrogen uh, on top of that, um, either before or after I put the clothes in, it doesn't matter. Um, feather meal is a, a nice one, it's a real slow release uh, nitrogen. Uh, Nature Safe has a really nice product that I started to use a lot of. Uh, it, there's a 1300, in other words, it's essentially feather meal plus blood meal plus you know, some seed meals. Um, they also have a 10. 8 or something like that. It's a little less nitrogen, but gives you some potassium, some phosphorus. Use your soil test because uh, it can be 
one or the other. Oh, I should say, uh, both of those of you at home and those of you here in the audience, if you want this presentation at the end, I'm happy to send it to you. Um, I'll, my email address, I think, is at the end, and you can just send me an email and I'll send you a PDF of it. Uh, so I appreciate you taking notes. It's great, but you don't need to uh, take it religiously. Um, so spread a little organic nitrogen. Uh, the question of how much is, there's no good answer to it. Um, I go down with a, uh, a scoop and I just go like this. And when it's roughly speaking, what you would see if that, if you had a screen laid on top of your bed so that you had a lot of, you could see a lot of your nitrogen, but you can also see a lot of soil underneath. I think that's, it's worked for me. Uh, I cannot tell you whether it's a lot too much. I don't think it is. I can't tell you whether I would benefit from even more. I might, but it works. It works pretty good. Um, and I encourage you to mess around with it uh, once, you, once you know what you're doing. And then come give this work to me. Uh, so you separate your clothes by hand. Um, so this is, um, this is one of the garlics that I grow. Now, folks at home, you need to see this. There you go. I hope you can see it. Um, this is one of the cloves. Um, there are like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven big cloves around the outside. This one has gotten a little bigger than I really want because it started to make a new group of cloves inside. That's what's wrong with that. Well, they're mostly too small to plant. And so the head has used a fair amount of its energy, rather than making these cloves bigger, it's used its energy to make new cloves on the inside. And if I'm gonna use this to plant with, which I would, I would probably use just the outside ring and then save these for cooking wood or something like that. The, the biggest heads come from the biggest cloves, hands down, no question. Uh, I can't remember, I don't think I had that. I, I played around with it in the field one year just to convince myself that it's true. Um, but in any event, you want to separate this by hand. Uh, I'll show you how to do it. Um, I'm going to make a bit of a mess here. Um, I'll do it here. I, I'll apologize. Oh, thank you. You're a smart guy. <laughs> I'm going to use a couple of minutes. I'm not really going to make very much of a mess. And, too big. So um, this is the this is the simple way to do it. The simple way is just use your finger to break the paper all the way around, and then you'll see. And then wiggle this back and forth a little bit, and then you'll see it's really not very hard at all to break those clothes off. And then those are nice clothes. That's a good planted clove size. This head probably weighs a third of a pound, it's you know, somewhere around a third of a pound. If I'm getting, say, eight cloves out of this, uh, what does that turn out to be? This would be about, not quite an ounce, but you know, something like a half an ounce or something like that. And that's a good size clove. And that will, in good soil, that will make you, you know, a head like this. Um, there is, I'm not gonna, well, maybe I'll try. There is a way, folks at home, you're not gonna be able to see this, sorry. Um, and this may not work, and. And you may not ever see it. You can see this on various videos on YouTube. If you've got, as I do, I've got to do like uh, 800 of these things. Um, and you end up getting, I'll, start, I'll talk over here for another minute. You end up getting, you know, blisters on your thumb or something like that. Um, and then I, last year, somebody sent me a video or I saw it on YouTube of a way to take, see that's a nice stiff net, is to take that and we'll try it pop it like that, and it didn't work, and all that happens, what's supposed to happen is that that basal plate is supposed to pop right off and leave your clothes. And I tried it once last year with one of the remaining heads that I had, and it worked great, but it's, it's fun, and you get to try it. So that's how you get your clothes apart. And, you know, for fewer than, you know, if you have 50 heads or something like that, don't risk ruining a head of garlic just to have fun like that. Instead, just use your fingers. It works fine. Um, and then I, I, you know, again, for larger plantings, a uh, simple dibble board. This is a piece of plywood. Those are wine corks. 
Um, and the little antennae at the top are just spacers. So that it's just, you know, just go like this and then like this uh, down the row. This is not an OSHA approved way to work, but it does actually uh, get you your, your spacing. What's the spacing on the board? Say again? What's the spacing on the forks? Yeah, yeah, thank you. So um, those are eight by eight, eight inches by eight inches. So in a 30 inch bed, you're gonna have three rows across. You could push it to four, but I would not recommend it. Um, and, uh, and then eight, eight inches down the row. I was just I was saying to uh, somebody else who grows garlic, every year for the last several years, I have experimented with the six inch spacing and every year, I lose track of which garlic I planted at six inches, so I never know how it works out. Um, so I can't tell you that six by six works just as well or six by eight. It probably does. Um, I've got a lot of uh, land. I'm not short on space, so I, I'm pretty happy with it. Being, but there's no reason not to try six by six. I think you probably find it works just great. Um, and if you are interested in making one of those boards, a piece of plywood, you just uh, drill a drywall screw in from the backside into the fork. It's the simplest thing in the world. I, mine has a pair of handles on the back, you know, cheap handles from the hardware store. Um, I actually uh, also have a pair of poles that will hold that thing so I don't have to bend over. I stopped using it and I, I haven't gone back to it. Okay. So this is what it looks like at planting time. <laughs> This is what it looks like at planting time. So that's the eight by eight grid. Um, the cork itself is probably an inch and a half. So you're you're you know making about a one inch hole. You don't have to. You can actually you could set them right on top. You don't need by any means whatsoever to get them down into the soil because you're going to be covering it with with leaves. Um, uh, root side down. That that um, you know the bottom side of this. You know, the thing that was attached here, that's the side you want down. You don't want the top down because it'll, it'll make its roots from this, this end. And if you put it upside down, it'll have to spend some energy. And it may never make it. Uh, try to get it done. Um, and then um, if you wanted to know what I think my secret is, um, it's not a secret at all. I use a lot of leaves as mulch. Um, I am a... a proselytizer for leaves in the organic garden. I think they are uh, bar none the best mulch you can use for many different reasons. And um, you can use other mulches. Uh, you don't have to use mulches at all. You can actually bury it down in the soil if you want to. Or the fellow I mentioned, Carl Hammer, didn't use mulch. He buried it in the soil. The problem is at that point, you have to dig it up. You actually need a, a digging fork or a tractor or something like that to get underneath the, uh, the garlic to pull it back out. And that's what, um, and you risk you know, damaging the crop. Whereas if you're mulching with whatever you mulch with, you don't need to do that. You don't need to do any digging at all. You grab it and pull it. Uh, and sometimes it's, most of the time it's easy. Sometimes it's a little hard. Some of them will resist and you can tell. Then you go in with a digging fork or even just scoop the soil away from it. Grab it, pull it. Almost, you know, 95% of them will just come right out of the ground. Um, so I think the next slide is about leaves. Uh, so I'll talk about leaves uh, more. And the, oh, so I say the sprouts will, will come right out through the leaves. One of the things when you get started with leaves early on, you might be worried about whether the plants are going to grow right through. Do not worry. They will come up. Um, they will find their way through anything you put on top of them. I wouldn't put this much on because that would be crazy. But if you put this much on top, they will absolutely just find their way up. They will stay nice and happy all winter long uh, and then come up at the right time. Yeah, so mulch options. Um, a lot of people do their garlic mulching with straw or salt marsh hay. No reason you can't accept it and cost you money. Um, and, uh, I grow mulch hay. Any of you on the EMAS craft mailing list, the, the listserv, will probably have just seen that I have mulch hay for sale. Um, but I don't use it myself. I, I'm not trying to tell you not to use it. 
I would much prefer to use Leeds because it's better. But if you do want to use Mulche, you certainly can. But I really don't recommend very much field hay that you don't know the source in your garden because it's going to come with a lot of weed seeds. Um, I could pretty much guarantee my customers that there's very little weed seed just because they want to cut. But you're not going to have that guarantee necessarily from somebody who uh, you're just buying it for. So whereas leaves don't have any seeds in them, or if they do, they have acorns, and you will find little oak trees coming in our garden, and you just pull them off. And, and about, literally, about two oak trees per year in a garden almost the size of this room. It's just never an issue. Um, so, and the worms just, oh my God. You know what worm castings look like? You know, the, the stuff that worms churn up. You will get a layer of worm castings at the leaf mulch, at the soil mulch interface. That's just, just beautiful. I really, 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 you could tell, recommend. Um, if you want to move a lot of leaves, um, this is an easy way to do it. Um, get yourself a, a really lightweight uh, wheelbarrow. Uh, attach some very flimsy plywood sides. These, um, these things here are just little pieces of uh, essentially flashing material. If you just buy flashing, cut it to size, drill a couple holes in it, um, you can attach it to your wheelbarrow. And then you can carry, you know, what's essentially three, almost four wheelbarrows worth on each load. They don't weigh anything. And so that's, it's really the best way to do it. Um, and you can't quite see, but that's my three prong hay fork, which is the best way to load the, the wheelbarrow. Okay, can I skip one of this one? Nope. Okay. So um, you should. You shouldn't see your, gar your garlic come up uh, until late March or early April. Um, but who knows what the rest of the you know, life is going to be like in global warming. We may start seeing it much sooner, much more often. Um, that might not be a problem. We'll, we'll find out. It certainly wasn't a problem this week. Um, they will push their way up to the leaves. If you're going to irrigate, if you're going to do drip irrigation, is put that irrigation in right away um, because once the leaves come up and start to intertwine with each other, it's just a pain. Um, but, you know, at that point, you're down your hands and knees and pulling the irrigation, the drip lines through, the, you know, snaking it through these, these leaves. Whereas if you get it down ahead of time, you don't have that problem. It's not a crime. You don't but, uh, It's better. And then I think, yeah, so this is what, Mine and, and just what everybody else has looked like in the middle of March. It has already been growing for almost a month uh, by the time that picture was done. Uh, they did fine. We had, did you guys, did you get a really severe frost in late May? I know, yeah. We had a, I mean, just an unbelievably cold, two cold nights in a row. Uh, I could have gone out with, Row cover and covered it, and you know, in retrospect, I'm not sure why I was stupid enough not to have done that, but it didn't matter. Once they, once they're up, they just seem to be just fine. And we had, I mean, I think we probably had 25 degrees out in the field. It may even have been colder. They just did fine. Um, it's a very cold. Again, this is German extra, extra hardy. Uh, maybe that's why. Maybe other varieties are a little more sensitive. I'm afraid I don't know. And then moving through the, the year. Um, so there are some pests, uh, and you may see some pests, um, <clears throat> but healthy soil is absolutely the, the best way to avoid the problems uh, with almost all of them. Um, this leaf moth, I don't, I don't know what the adult looks like. I, I didn't grab a picture. But that's a little pupil case, and that's a penny sitting next to it, I think. Um, then the pupil cases get laid uh, down the that, down the stalk, down um, you know somewhere down in here, and uh, and the stalk itself will probably wither, you know, yellow and wither and and fall over. Oh, sorry, folks at home. Uh, 
uh, down here. And the, and the stock will yellow and bitter. Um, as far as I can tell, I, I've had them a couple of times, not bad, but I've seen it. As far as I can tell, the heads are just fine. Uh, they are they're laying their eggs in the part that you're going to get rid of anywhere, uh, anyway. And, um, and the larvae are eating the part that you're going to get rid of anyway. So as far as I can tell, it's not, not really fun. Now, wire worms are a problem, and the problem with good organic soil is that's what wire worms like. I don't have any recommendations for you to get rid of wire worms. In fact, the best way may be to grow garlic because it exudes some, you know, repulsive thing for the wire worms. But if you see wire worms, you may get little nicks in your clothes, little sort of dark spots. Um, as far as I can tell, they don't actually prevent that garlic from sprouting and becoming, uh, you know, perfectly good plant next year. There's certainly no reason <clears throat> to get rid of a garlic that's been nicked by a wire worm. Um, if you have a lot of wire worms, you have a problem. And I don't know how to tell you, to, to, I don't know what to tell you except to seek professional help for, for a lot of wire worms. Uh, but um, you may see a problem. And then quack grass. Uh, anybody here not know what quack grass is? Okay. It's a, it is a laterally invasive grass. It looks like normal sort of field grass on top. It's got these long white underground runners that with very sharp tips. Uh, and the, the runners can go feet, I mean like 12 feet out. It's just amazing. Uh, but they are very sharp. And the problem is that if they hit your garlic, they'll put a little, oh, sometimes they'll even go right through, which is terrible. But uh, in any event, they could damage your garlic as well. Again, it's not a problem for saving it. Uh, it is a problem for, for selling. Uh, and if you have quack grass, and I have, I grow in old, uh, what was an old hay field that is essentially turned into a quack grass field. I have that old quack grass every single year, but it can be good. In June, the garlic will put up its scape. This little curly cue thing up here, it comes up first as a, just a gentle, actually it comes up first straight and then it turns like this and then it curly cues around. Um, and you do want to snap that off in order to uh, have a plant focus on making the biggest clothes. Um, uh, again, a lesson from Carl. And the reason I keep bringing him up, he was a commercial garlic grower before he started Vermont Compost. So he had some, some experience. Carl said, no, we never took the scapes off. I can't tell you that they made them any particularly smaller. They probably did, but it wasn't worth the labor. OK. Um, and uh, I, I think the world is, is full of people who think garlic scapes are great. And then there's other people like me who said, I do not want, know what to do with this stuff. I give them to my CSA customers by the bucket load if they want them. Um, and they take them and they do stuff with them. Uh, there, as I say, it's not a huge market, um, but if you are, you know, if you're getting up to you know several hundred cloves, you may have more cloves, uh, several hundred heads, you may have more scapes than you know what to do with and then it's time to start start selling them or give them away. Um, so, uh, so you do want to snap them off, though, uh, one way or the other. And the uh, best time to do that is as soon as you see them. But you could do it you know, any time after that as well. Uh, <clears throat> and then I say, or leave a few on, see what happens. And what happens is this. Um, the, uh, this come, came up and was like this. But then as the flower developed, it straightens itself back up. And it puts up this flower head. And this head has both flowers, this little sort of corona of little delicate things here. And then underneath those flowers, at the base of each one, is what's called a bulbil, which is a tiny, and I do mean tiny, little garlic bulb. And you can take those garlic bulbs and grow them, put them in the soil, water them, let them grow and they will turn into tiny little garlic plants. And if you then just leave them right where they are, 
let them come up another year, there will be bigger garden plants. And probably you need a three-year cycle or so until you get to be something that's worth sort of pulling out of the ground, separating clones, and then replanting. You can grow these for tiny little garlic scape, uh, no, sorry, garlic scallions, uh, which are kind of cool. And then, in fact, in the second year, I think they're probably even better as garlic scallions. And garlic scallions are a pretty good crop uh, for the people who buy garlic scallions. Uh, and they're delicious. Hey, anyway, so that's what you do with your scapes. <clears throat> and then I say, you say, you say some of those flower clusters, so there you go. And then, <laughs> importantly, store them. I won't show you how easily those come off, but they do come off really easily. I would say, take a mesh bag or, or just a paper bag out of the field with you and clip them in the bag. It's, it's kind of pop off. And that's everything about expanding them. And that's, this is what they look like when they come up that first year. They're really a little small for scallions. Um, you could gather you know, 30 or 40 of them together and maybe sell them to somebody who's a real gourmet. All right, and then we get to the question of when to harvest. <clears throat> As I say, what you're trying to do is to maximize the head size and, and get there before the clothes begin to separate out, breaking their outer papers, uh, and, uh, uh, and then dirt gets in. It's not as pretty as um, So these are my harvest dates for the last several, seven or eight years. Um, Mostly, I've been sort of seeing around the, the 20th or so of July this year because of the, the winter that we had, the non-winter that we had. It was 13th was, was uh, time to harvest. Um, and it probably could have been three or four days before that. I just That was a good day for me. I recommend, uh, and this is what I do, I just get down to you know open up the mulch around half a dozen plants. If of those half a dozen, one of them's already split, it's time to get to work. Um, if not, you know, let it go, you know, just let it go for another few days. Uh, and then the other thing is, so this is my garlic field on, I think, I thought I had the date on there. I think that was the 8th of July. 6th or something, something like that. And you can tell there's a lot of yellow out in that field. The plants are starting to look as though they're ready to senesce, and that's what they're doing. Um, and those changes happen really quickly. If you would look a week before, it would have looked like a much healthier stand. If you look a week after, everything would be brown and ready to, uh, ready to fall apart. Um, so you want to get them out in that, in that sweet spot if you can. Do you, um, do you, um... One of the things that I do is uh, I count the leaves from the bottom up when they die. Yeah. And usually when I have the fourth leaf dead, that's when I put my garlic and hold them tight with those dates. Yep. I, there are, that's a good scheme. My scheme, if I'm counting leaves, is actually instead to count the number of green leaves that are left, and I'm looking for three, uh, not five, not four, but three. And the reason is, and I'll show you in fact why, is because if I want to, I want a really, really clean crop, I need those live leaves, and I'll show you what that's about. But it's yeah, and and you may very well find, <laughs> in fact, if you wait for three leaves, that they become detached as that close, as the head opens up, and you've waited too long. So for, I don't know. Anyway, it's. Um, no, I'm saying I count four dead. Yeah, you found it four dead leaves. And on a, right, and on a plant that has seven leaves, your scheme and my scheme work great. On a plant that has five leaves, that's too late. And it's a plant that has eight leaves, that's about as many as you ever see. It's probably a little too early. But I think the differences we're talking about there between four leaves versus five leaves versus threes is probably less than an ounce in a whole head. It's it's probably a pretty small amount. I don't think you can go wrong picking it three days too soon, and that and that might be the difference we're talking about. So what do you do after you pull the plant up? Um, if I if you were if you heard my talk in fact three years ago, I would be telling you one thing. I changed my practice, and I'll tell you why. What I do now, which I really actually kind of recommend, is um, you pull it up, 
you clip it right there, you get rid of this part, makes a nice mulch, um, and then this much of it, what, the stuff that I showed you, the piece of the bag there, I dry it. Now, you will see many, 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 many people will take the whole plant and hang it up to dry. You can do that. There's no reason you can't. Um, it takes more space and, and you know, eventually you're gonna clip it off anyway. Um, there's a fear in the world which is entirely unjustified that if you clip it too soon, you will introduce uh, rotting. It doesn't happen. I've been doing this for 10 years now, and it doesn't happen. Um, and I, I know other garlic groves that try to do it. It's just, you know, these things are more or less orally transcribed, I mean, trans, transmitted, and it takes a while. It may never take off, and the garlic world may disagree with me for them forever. I don't know. But in any event, I, there's nothing wrong with clipping it, and it just makes your life a lot easier. I put mine on bread trays, um, because I happen to have a whole bunch of bread trays. You can put yours on a greenhouse bench, and just lay it out on a bench uh, and let it dry. Uh, it takes a week and a half or so, something like that. Um, uh, one deep, I would not recommend, certainly at the beginning, you do more than one deep, because you do want airflow over the whole thing. If you have a fan, great. If you don't, you don't need it as long as the air can move freely across it. Um, now, again, this is, this is what it looks like. I mean, it's dirty, right? Um, when I pull this out of the ground, it usually there's a clump of dirt here. And I try to get off as much as I can. I was in a hurry the, the day that I harvested this year, and there were a lot of them that didn't get all that dirt cleaned off. It doesn't matter, though. It'll dry. I mean, dirt will dry in a day, and you don't have to worry about it. The garlic is going to take a week to dry, and the dirt's going to be dry long before the garlic is. Um, so, you know, they're discolored and they're ugly. And if you take this to market, um, some people will pass by and say, oh, it's got really good. Um, whereas if you, after it's dry, you just sort of do that and you know, pull, this, pull this cover off, it looks a little bit better already. And if you, you know, take the time to take one leaf off, you know, it, can, it gets even nicer underneath that. Um, and that may matter at your market, or it might not. Um, and if you're bringing garlic that is, uh, if you're bringing garlic that everybody wants anyway, you could probably do a little less work than if you've got, you know, if you're new to a market or something like that. If you're if you're running a CSA, hand it to them, you know, because they can do their own cleaning and they know you as a farmer, and it's no, it's not a problem. So. Um, the, uh, the 10 to 14 days of curing, um, I rather like that chart. I made this last year from, from my own experiments. I took, uh, what, 68 heads, different sizes, uh, put them on a bread tray, weighed them every day uh, from the day of harvest until whatever it is, two weeks later, or 10 days later, I guess. And you can see what happens. They lose, they lose weight rather rapidly for four or five days, and then they level off. In fact, if you let it go another month, it'll weigh a little less. And if you let it go six months, it'll weigh even less. And if you let it go eight months, it'll just be a dry husk. But you're getting it down. Once you're past a week, maybe 10 days at most, you're at the point at which you can store it. Um, and then you don't have to store it when you, you can store it in a bulk crate, stack the bulk crate up, you know, three or four or five deep. Um, and I stick mine in my basement, which is, uh, we keep a dehumidifier on, but it's not perfect product storage. Uh, I mean, temperature, temperature and humidity, but it works. Uh, yeah, so that's how you, as I say, this is now how I do it. If you asked me a couple of years ago, um, this is how I did, in fact, every head that I, that I um, harvested. And I would just spend a few days doing this. And I got, it was truly the most beautiful garlic you'd ever seen. Because if you get that dirt off early, before the, the leaves, the wrappers have had a chance to dry out, they're white as snow. I mean, it's just amazing. And um, 
So if you wanted to, and, and you could probably you know, charge a premium for that beautiful clean gun. I don't know whether it would be valuable enough, you know, the extra premium would be valuable enough to justify the time. Each one of them takes 35 to 45 seconds, something like that. And if you're doing a thousand heads, that's a lot of time. Um, but you know, maybe it works out. Do the math. Um, anyway, what you do um, is fun to try, and and you know, if you're giving if you're giving garlic as presents, this is the way to do it, right? If you if you know you're going to have extra garlic and you know you want to give some at, at uh, holiday time or for a birthday or something like that, this is the way to do it. Um, this is why I want to make sure I have three live leaves because I want that head when it's all done to have three leaves around it. And the lower leaves, the ones that have, you know, died off and dried, those I could strip, uh, at least a couple of them I could strip to get that dirt off. But the upper ones I want to leave on, and I want to make sure I have enough to hold on to. So strip the outer uh, living leaves, that pulls all the dirt off. You can uh, take, a, take a sprayer and spray off all the heavy dirt, and then strip the outer leaves. Um, you'll see where I cut these. As far as I can tell, um, you could cut this right here, and it wouldn't matter. Um, I got into the habit, you know, the hand with the bone. But as far as I can tell, you can, I tried, you can go, certainly go down to there. Um, but this is nice. It's, it's visually distinctive, which I like a lot. Um, it's not unique by any means, but it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty nice. And people will. Anyway, um, so uh, then, you know, Rinse it again because your hands are going to be dirty while you're, while you're playing with it, uh, and then put it out to cure. Uh, let it sit for a week, and then uh, and then you're, and then you're done. And then you know if this were if this were one of those, it would look like that instead of like this, and, and it would be a, a great thing. I used to I used to think I could get an extra fifty cents uh, on the head for that, and I think I was wrong. I don't think most people who are buying garlic care. And I saved a bunch of them for Christmas because I have a your own Christmas tree business and I put them out for sale. And as far as I can tell, nobody was buying them for presents. They were all buying them to cook and they didn't care. So that experiment has ended. Okay, and then uh, we're wrapping up here. Um, so I really encourage you to save your own seed garlic. It is heartbreaking to have to do because you have this beautiful crop and now you have to put aside 20 to 25% of it. You can't sell it, you can't cook with it, you can't give it away, you have to hold on to it. Um, but it's absolutely the cheapest way to over a couple of years uh, really increase your crop. Uh, the biggest cloves make the biggest heads. And I, I told you before on that head that I split open, I would use the outer ones for next year's crop and use the inner ones to cook with. There's no reason you can't plant an inner small clove. You'll just get, you know, on average, a smaller head. Um, and that head may have a large, couple of large cloves on it. You know, the cycle continues. Um, I put this business about garlic and arts festival. I, have you ever been, anyone ever been to a garlic and arts festival? So it's a fun event. It's, it's out in uh, Orange, and uh, and it attracts a huge crowd, and people bring their garlic there to sell. I could not believe the price of, of garlic. $40 a pound for seed garlic. And I hope I'm not insulting anybody who is either watching from home or not in this audience. And I, I said to myself, boy, I should I should just come here with all my garlic and I should sell it and I'd make a million dollars. Well, I, I'm not going to do that. And, and in fact, they're all, all the spaces are taken for this year anyway, so I have to get ahead. But I, I really would recommend if you're going to try to expand your garlic production, you do it on your own. And if you want to buy it, you should be paying somewhere between 18 and $24 something like that seems to be where where it is i can't hear i'm about half deaf oh 
$64 a pound. Wow. So this is where, you know, we get into like the, the tulip mania question. Like, is that really what garlic should be going for? I am all for farmers, you know, gouging the public. Absolutely, <laughs> right? Why not? But at $64 a pound, there are other places to buy garlic for, you know, half of that, a third of that. And bless them for doing it and bless all those people that are, that are buying it there, but you and I are shopping somewhere else, I think. Um, but anyway, I, so if you wanted, if, now what about supermarket garlic? I, I don't know the answer to that question, really. I guess if I were desperate, I would go to Whole Foods and I would buy certified organic garlic. Um, oh, that it was fine. Uh, my next slide, I think, talks about garlic diseases a little bit more. And I'm not worried about that when I go to Whole Foods. What I'm really worried about is whether I'm buying a garlic that is regionally appropriate. Oh, it grows pretty much everywhere. You can probably grow almost any garlic, almost anywhere. But I'm just a little less sure that a garlic from Idaho or California is really what I, what I want to do. Um, anyway, here we go. And then, uh, how are we doing on time? We're fine? Okay, good. Okay. So, um, the, 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 the question when you buy garlic, seed garlic, right? You can go to Johnny's. High Mullen, curiously, doesn't sell seed garlic anymore. They have an interesting note up on their, on their site about why they don't. I was looking at this last night as I was finishing off the slide. Um, High Mullen doesn't sell. Um, but Johnny's and Fedco do. Um, and there are you know, lots of other places. Fillory Farm is where, in fact, I've got my original stock. And there are other places. Almost none of them will, will be selling certified disease-free garlic. And those, that phrase means something in the garlic world. I'm going to talk about what it means. It's, this is entirely different than certified organic. Those are they're two entirely different things. A lot of people will sell, cert, I sell certified organic garlic for you know, all the purposes that I use it for. Um, but I don't sell certified disease free because that's a uh, set of steps in order to have certified disease free garlic that almost no small scale garlic producers are going to be going for. What, what is that? <clears throat> the reason you would want it is there are two major soil borne problems that garlic is susceptible to, that if you have it, you're sunk. And if you don't have it, you would never know that it could be a problem. Uh, one of them is garlic white rot fungus. It makes heads that look like that thing in the upper white, where they're just kind of shrunken and ugly, and, and just you pull it out of the ground, and you say, nice, and you, you, you know, pack, bag it up, and you take it to the incinerator. Um, garlic white rock fungus will live in the soil for 40 years without a host, right? This is just things waiting for you to plant onions or garlic back in that same soil, so it can hold it five cycle, 40 years on. If you have this white rock fungus in your soil, you pack it up and you move somewhere else and you don't take your garlic with you because you probably almost certainly will, will transfer you start again. Um, stem and bulb nematode is a little more common. And in fact, this has, there are places in New England that have reported having it. It may be that you and I have a little bit. What I'm hoping, fingers crossed, is that if I have it, my soil is good enough that it's a small problem for a small number of heads. I don't think I do, but I have not taken the microscope to my heads to be sure. My heads look great, but I can't, I can't guarantee it. No, I can't, I mean, I can't survey for sure, but I can guarantee it. Um, the way that you, and that, that is four years. You just grow garlic somewhere else on your farm. The nematodes die out if they don't find their host in the fifth year of the year. Is that the bottom photo, Richard? Sorry? Is that the bottom photo? Yeah, and that's the bottom photo here. 
uh, of uh, other ugly dark. Yeah. So the, 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 the top one is a fungus, the bottom is a nematode. How do you get them? By planting stuff that has them. Um, the fungus, as far as I have read, it's not like uh, an airborne problem that would blow up from the south or something like that, like the way that late flight does. Um, and the nematode for sure just, just goes on garlic. Um, and so if you're unlucky enough to plant something, I really don't recommend uh, planting garlic that you've never, that if you don't know the farmer and you don't know their means of production. Um, it's just, <laughs> it's like the SCD of the plant world. You just want to know who you're doing business with. Um, so the way that the, the certification works um, is you start with tissue culture. In other words, you take a tissue sample of, you and I don't, I mean, labs do, take a tissue sample, uh, grow it up on Petri dishes, you know, guarantee with microscope and DNA testing and stuff like that, that it doesn't have any of these pests in it. And then you grow those into plants. Uh, that's what's called in the biz the foundation stock. So you have a, you know, a, an acre or so on your farm that's your foundation area. Nothing goes into that except tissue culture. You would never, ever, ever plant something new into it. Um, and then the foundation stock, well, you have to, you know, you can't do this forever. So you, you then take those things and put them somewhere else. That's your registration stock. Registration? Yes, states control this certification process. Um, and you have now registered that this acre over here is my registration stock. And I'm going to use that to make my certified stock. So, you know, XYZ farm has, say, 10 acres of registration land and it's selling out of that what they're going to be selling a certified stock. Um, and that's what a big commercial grower will buy, 10,000 pounds of it, plant that. Um, and then sell that either for culinary or non-certified seed garlic. With any luck, you get to the end of that process and you're selling clean garlic. Um, and it doesn't matter for cooking, but it does matter for where you're going. Anyway, that's a long explanation for stuff that you probably never interact with. There are relatively few farms that sell certified organic and certified disease-free in other words, both, both certifications. I could not, no, I found one last night when I was searching. Um, I can't remember. If, if you care, then And that's, a, I think that's, that might be it. Um, yeah, if you're not already a member, join the FMS. Uh, if you want a copy of this, uh, just send me an email, farm at hopestill.com, um, and um, I'd be happy to send you a copy of the uh, uh, of the presentation. Um, and everybody gets ahead of garlic. Other questions, either online or in person? Ready? Yeah, there you go. We have another bag back here somewhere. Good question. Thank you. What's it? It was a good question. Yeah, hold on. Garlic gifts. Sorry, folks at home, you have to come by the farm if you want one. Growing. If you do, um, if you do want to uh, buy seed garlic, I have brought some with me, and I'd be happy to um, do business with you after this is over. That's the next part of my time. <laughs> <laughs> That's sixty dollars a pound. No, twenty dollars a pound. Um, yeah. Uh, question was. 
Well, but I'm half deaf, so I'm going to ask you to share. Good question. Uh, the question was, will those diseases affect other crops besides garlic? Um, both of them are, are allium uh, specific pests. And so onions, uh, leeks, uh, shallots, uh, whatever, uh, and garlic as well. So yeah, you want to you want to stay away. If you have one of those, you would want. It's a good idea to rotate garlic anyway. And a five-year rotation, if you have the space to do it, is excellent because then at least the nematode problem you will not. You know, if you had it one year, you'd be a pretty good shot for not having it after that. Um, I don't. I don't think. You know, if your garden is no bigger than say this area right here, I'm not sure that's enough space for the rotation to mean anything because the nematode itself is somewhat mobile in the soil. Um, but if your garden is, you know, as big as this whole room, it probably is actually big enough to go, you know, one, two, three, four, five, and then back here, because uh, the nematodes are not that mobile. Um, I have no idea. I haven't had these problems, I think. Um, so I, I really can't do more than sort of tell you the little bit I've read. Um, and it's just, you know, if you make your soil sing, um, you probably won't ever, I mean, if you make your soil sing and you don't import sketchy garlic, you'll probably never see these problems. Um, it's not as though they are spontaneously created in bad soil, but if your garlic is growing in bad soil and it's presented with uh, you know, a pest challenge, it'll fall prey to it. Some of the time in good soil, it won't, we hope. Uh, question? Um, so if you have other allergens, yeah. Yes. Yes. The question was, uh, can other alliums transfer those same diseases to your garlic? Yeah, absolutely. Luckily, though, we don't, for the most part, replant other alliums. Like, we, we, you should recognize, right, a garlic is a clone. This, this garlic here is genetically identical to the garlic that I was planting 10 years ago. And that's true of none of the other alliums that I plant. All the rest of them all start from seed, and seed doesn't trans transmit this. It's only because I'm planting out the same, you know, tissue, tissue, tissue. Uh, that that's, that's happening. Uh, yes, ma'am? What's the benefit of planting with a clove versus seed? Versus seed? Yes. I don't think anybody would sell you a garlic seed. I've never seen them for sale. You can make garlic seeds, and that head, if you let the pollinators get to it, would actually make seeds at the base of these flowers. Not these bubbles, those are separate, but it would actually make seeds, and you could plant those, but you get this tiny little sliver of a thing, and then you'd be in that three, maybe four year cycle of getting it up to something that's really marketable. Um, whereas if you start with a, a whole clove, you get a whole head the next the next year. Yes, ma'am. Um, for curing or drying, what's the kind of ideal condition? Is there any sort of maybe you said I ideal? Ideal conditions, conditions for drying, even for drying, not for storing. Yeah. Yeah. Ideal conditions for drying. I'll tell you what's ideal. Um, Arizona is great. Yeah. <laughs> you know, under shade. Um, no, probably you know. Every garlic grower you and I know, whatever they have is going to work. What I do is, um, what I used to do is put up a pop-up tent on my driveway, stack my bread trays up, draw the extension cord out, put a fan on it, and let it sit and hope that I didn't get big rains. And if I got big rains, cover it with a tarp until the rain's over and then take it off. It works. Uh, what I've been doing the last couple of years is, in fact, taking it to a bench along one side of my hoop house, make sure that the roll up side doesn't drip onto those benches, uh, lay my bread trays, again stacked out there, 
Um, no fan, because I don't have any electricity. It worked great. Um, it really, it wants to go to sleep um, unless you prevent it from uh, drying out. Um, it will go to sleep. And when I failed with soft neck garlic, it was because I didn't let it uh, dry out. It, it was all too clumped together. This is the other problem with soft neck garlic is you have to leave the stems in and the stems are really fleshy and you have to separate them all around. So it's just bad, just bad scene and I didn't repeat it. Um, yeah. And then as far as ideal storage, which you've been asked, but it's a good question. I don't know what ideal storage is. I mean, somebody does, but I don't know what it is. But uh, a basement that, you know, has a dehumidifier in it. I keep garlic until February if I have any left by then. It's still good. By March, it's probably dried out to the point at which you could cook with it, but you you know half of your clothes might be too dry to, to really do it. should it'll last a long time. And they never will. I mean they always dry out. They never will. Any other questions? Yeah. So, I I have a question about the and you wet it at all, but you say you should wash it off. Oh, no, so the washing off, uh, it's actually, if you were, if you wanted that to be a beautiful, pristine white, you could actually dunk it in water, gently rub it with a cloth or something like that, um, take one of those outer papers off. And actually, if you, if you soak it in water for like five minutes, the outer paper will actually get soft enough to finish peeling it, and the inside one will be nicer. Um, and then let it dry again, and you know it's like laundry dry in a couple of hours or something like that. Um, I don't recommend. It. Um, I haven't done it very often, only four or five times, and it's fine. But I don't recommend. It. I would with that if you want to plant it. There's no reason to clean it whatsoever. Um, just use it the way it is. Um, and um, uh, and if you do want to give us a present, just tell them that it's really all this dirt on the outside. Uh, yeah. Any other questions? I've always made a point not to do the washing because of a mold problem that can happen in storage, and if it gets moldy. I, you know, except the way that I used to do it, I would take a garden hose, spray it all down, dunk it in a bucket clean it off, clip it, dunk it in a bucket again, and then let it dry. Never lost a hand. It, it seems to, I mean, it's just, this stuff is just, it's just, it's really hard to go wrong. This is not true of onions, and, and nothing you learn here today, you should apply to the curing of onions, which are an entirely separate beast. They have to have their, their tops on, as far as I can tell. They're very sensitive to rot, and still they're completely dry. Um, very, very different. Anything else? Well, thank you all. It's really been a pleasure. Any questions from the folks at home? No. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. And if you do want some garlic, I have I have brought some.